Amen. Thank you, Perla. Hey, you may be seated. Uh, if you're a kid, you are dismissed. You can make your way out to the back. You'll be met out there. Um, if you're a parent with a baby, you are welcome to it. You certainly don't have to, but we have a cry room in the back corner there that you're welcome to use as well. Um, hey, just a shout out to everybody that came last night. We were at the San Dimas Trunk or Treat, and I know Megan said 2,000 people, but what I heard, it was actually 4,000 people that were there yesterday. It was massive, um, but we're just so excited. We were there. Uh, we're giving out flyers, giving out Starbucks cards and all that, and hopefully just a blessing to the community. You know, that's what, that's what I want our, our church to be. It's just a light in the community. You know, so many people view Christians as your judgmental bigots, whatever, you know, I, I want us to be the opposite. I want us to be people who are loving, who are kind, uh, who are a light in this community. And I think that's what we did last night. So if you would just join us in prayer for all those families that we gave flyers, join us in prayer for this Thursday night, and then maybe next Sunday they'd come as well. Uh, that's our mission, right? To give the good news of Christ to the world. So with that, let me pray one more time, and we'll dive into our text together this morning. Uh, Heavenly Father, again, we praise you, we rejoice uh, Lord, you are good. You are marvelous. And, and even like that song said, in moments when we feel like life surrounds us, problems surround us, uh, Father, you've said that you hold us as your children and that you will never leave us nor forsake us and that that is our hope. I ask that you'd speak through your word this morning, Lord, that we'd come to know you more, to love you more. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, if you have a Bible or a smartphone, go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 4. We're going to be in verse, starting in verse 2 of Mark chapter 4 in a moment here. But, you know, I want to start with this. There's kind of an interesting thing in life that as you get older, you learn about. And this is it, that you don't have control over your circumstances all the time. Right? You know what I'm saying? As you get older, you realize I have less and less control sometimes of what happens, what comes in. You know, I was trying to be healthy. I was trying to not have an injury, but then injuries happen. You know, things happen. People come into your life that annoy you. I mean, different things happen throughout life. But here's what you do have control over. Your response. You know that? Right, 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 that you always, you're the one that's responsible. And, and this is what kind of shows maturity and wisdom over time is that hopefully your responses are different than they were when you were a teenager. You know what I'm talking about? Because different scenarios show us different responses. I, I always love like on YouTube or on the news, you see those people that get pulled over by a police officer and it's for something minor. It's like a bad taillight and it's going to be a $25 fix-it ticket, but this person can't keep their mouth shut and they start, you know, arguing with the police officer. You ever seen this? They start throwing insults at them and saying all this stuff and pretty soon they're in handcuffs and you're like, why'd you respond like that? You know, you know why didn't you, it was a $25 fix-it ticket. But how you respond matters. I remember years ago, I finally got my, my dream car. It was a 61 Lincoln Continental Convertible. If you know what it is, you know what it is. It's a beautiful car, but it needed some restoration. So I got this thing. We tore out the inside of it. And then, you know, kind of to my sadness, I saw the floorboards were rotted out with rust. And if you know cars, that's the worst thing ever is when they're rusted. So I'm like, okay, i got to get these panels welded. Um, but I, I don't have a welder here. My buddy has a welder. So I decided I'm going to drive it with no seats, no flooring, and with a big old hole in the roof, uh, or not, in the floor, it, it doesn't have a roof, it's convertible, uh, and I'm going to drive it across town to his house, which is always a good idea. So I, I put this little box right there, and I sat down, and I began to drive this thing, and no convertible, you know, I'm sitting there, and there's whole, I'm seeing the ground go by me, but I was in Sierra Madre, and if you know Sierra Madre, there's a street called Baldwin that comes off the 210, it goes way, way up, it's really steep. I'm at the top of the hill, he's at the bottom of the hill. So I begin to drive this thing, no seatbelt, no seat, just, you know, looking to the floor, and then I go to put my foot on the brake for the first stop sign, and there ain't no brakes. And it's one of those moments where, this is a 5,500 pound car, right? This is a, what they call it a land yacht or a boat. I mean, it, it starts flying down the, the only thing that did work was a speedometer, which is very convenient. Um, <laughs> And so I'm flying down here, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, I've got to respond to this situation. You know, what will my dad do? What will my wife say? You know, this is the end of my life. And I'm picking up speed, picking up speed. I see some children on the side of the road, and I'm like, dear Lord, just help me not to kill them. You know, I'm going down, I'm going down, and then the first intersection, uh, I'm looking both ways. Thankfully, there's no cars, and so I flew through that. Second stop sign, I go to honk the horn. The horn doesn't work. And, and uh, you know, I flew through it until finally at the the very end, I'm like, I either go in, all the way down to the 210 freeway and fly onto the freeway, or I try to make a fast left turn on one of these streets. 
And so I'm going, I'm going, I'm praying, and as quickly as I can, I turn the wheel, and I kid you not, like half of the car was in the air, the other half was on the side, I flew into the other street, and by God's grace, slowed down to a stop. It was it. And then I came home, and I told my wife, and she's like, I don't believe that. That didn't happen. I was like, no, it was amazing. You should have seen how calm I was. Um, but but the, 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 sometimes I can get a little far-fetched, but that's a true story. Um, but, but see, the thing is, is how you respond, right? And, and there's different people that how we respond in different situations. You know the person when you're a kid who you went to if you had a crisis, if you're bleeding, you maybe went to mom instead of dad, right, or vice versa. Some people decide of blood they can't handle it. You know, some people decide, this is too much, but some people decide to vomit, they can't handle, handle it, and then stuff happens. I remember as a kid, there was th one person vomited, and then three other people vomited, just seeing it. You know what I'm talking about? I'll stop talking about vomit, I promise. <laughs> um, but how you respond matters. It responds in your marriage. It, respond, it, it, it matters in your life. Um, your responses um, can make or break your life. Can they not? And, and your responses have long-term consequences that can sometimes never go away. I mean, some of you hear from a bad response, you, you just cringe when you think about it. You just wish, man, I, I wish I could go back and respond differently. And maybe you're still struggling with that today. You know what I'm talking about? How you respond matters. And Jesus is going to tell this story, and it's all about your response. It's all about not just how you respond to this story, but how you respond to people that respond to this story. And we're going to see that in a moment. So if you have your Bible, a little context real quickly. Jesus, um, he's been teaching. Uh, the crowds are growing. He's been doing miracles. Ministry's going well. It's had some bumps. The Pharisees have attacked him, as you've seen the last few weeks. Uh, but he's still going strong. And he, he begins to preach. And what happened was, is there were so many people that they have this idea of, hey, Jesus, let's put you on this little boat. We'll anchor it down just a little bit off the shore. And maybe as you speak, the people will be able to hear you and the, the voice will echo off the water. So he begins to teach. But what's interesting is right before he begins to teach, um, he says this word. He says, listen. And you're like, well, obviously you're going to say listen. But Jesus didn't usually say that. And if you look at the original language in the Greek, uh, the word listen is an imperative, which means a command, right? So he's saying, hey, everybody, you have to get this. This is vital. And he begins to tell them this story about a farmer. And let, let, let me read you the first, uh, first verse in chapter, two, or chapter 4, verse 2. He says this, and he was teaching them many things in parables. And his, in his teaching, he said to them, listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. And that's not like sewing machine with drapes and curtains, right? Like, like that's a farmer. And he begins to tell them this story about a farmer. And what's, what, what was unique about this um, is everybody back then was really familiar with farming. You know, there wasn't a whole lot of careers going on but back around Galilee in the day. It's not like you had a, you know, a service technician or all these different jobs. Like, you're either a farmer, a fisherman, construction. The, the jobs were few. So everybody knew about farming. So he tells them the story. He says, look, there's this farmer. He went out, he started throwing seeds on the ground. And some of the seeds, they fell on the ground, and then the birds came uh, and they ate the seeds. And imagine if you're listening to this, you're kind of like, okay, Jesus, I get it, makes sense. Why do I have to listen so carefully? Birds eat seeds, we know that. And then he says, no, listen, listen to this. Then there's some more seeds that went down, uh, and those seeds fell, but they fell on the rocks. And they sprouted up real quickly, but they could, their roots couldn't go down, so they died really quickly. And other people are like, yeah, you don't plant you know, a crop on a rock bed. Okay, we get it. And he says there's a third group. They threw the seeds down, and they fell on pretty decent soil. But then weeds came up, and they killed the plants. And then he tells a fourth soil that, that lands on good ground, rises up, and it's a healthy crop. But here's what's interesting. At the end of the story, Jesus says, to him who has an ear let him hear. So he emphasizes in the beginning, hey, super important that you listen to it. And then at the end, he says, hey, super important that you listen to it. But if you're listening to that story, you would have been like, okay, what's the point? You just told us, fat. I mean, you didn't give us a call to action. You didn't say, hey, maybe use fertilizer or something like that. You just said, hey, throw the seeds down. I mean, we get it. There's birds. That's why we have scarecrows. You know, that, that like, don't throw it on the rock. We get, he didn't give them a command. So they're confused. So Jesus' disciples come to him a little later, and they're like, okay, Jesus, what did that mean? What was the point of it? Look at what Jesus says. Look at what Jesus says in verse 13. And he said to them, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the seed, 
And these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. Jesus says, hey, the farmer, the seed being thrown, that's the word of God. That's the key to the story. In the, in the 1960s, some of you were there, some of you read about it, um, but in the 1960s, a lot of things happened, right? You had the landing on the moon, um, you had, you know, people wearing bell-bottom pants and they didn't know how to shave, uh, you had people, there was social reform, I mean, there's a lot of different historical things that happened, but one of the things that's really significant that we often kind of glance over of the 60s is there was this movement called this, God is dead. You ever heard of that? that there was a huge thing that went about, really popular by different professors, that they said, look, back in the day, God spoke to people, right? We, we have the Old Testament, we have the New Testament, there was miracles and all of that, but now it just feels like, where is he? And, and it, what it was is, is their way of really just saying, God doesn't speak, therefore he doesn't exist. You get the logic? And, and I understand why they, why they said that, but the reality is, this text is saying that God does speak. Let me read you Hebrews 1, 1 through 2. It said, long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. So it's saying, yeah, back in the day, God spoke to the prophets. There's miracles. There's all this good stuff. And then verse 2, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. So Jesus came. He's the image of God, right? John 1 says, the beginning was the word. The word was with, with God. The word was God. And then we have it recorded in Scripture. So we believe, right, that God does speak, but he speaks to us through, that, through this book. And then on top of that, I still believe that miracles happen. I know some of you I've talked to, you've seen miracles happen, right? And, and I believe that God speaks through his church that he's still working. And this is the significance of this text, is it's saying, look, God is sending out his word to the whole world. Some people criticize this and they're like, okay, that's kind of a bad farmer. Because why would a farmer, aren't you supposed to like get your tractor and plow it first and then carefully plant the seeds? You know, why is he just throwing it everywhere? But back in the day, that was the strategy. Is that you just got your seeds, you threw them all over the place, and then you kind of got this stick. They didn't have tractors if you didn't know that. And then they would kind of plow a line and then hope that the seeds were in there would grow up. But it's illustrating the fact that God has a heart that the world would know him. Scripture says this, right? He's not willing that any should perish, but what? But that all should come to the knowledge of the truth. Right? And that his church, that our calling is to spread that word. But here's the tension. Stay with me if you can. Here's the tension. Not everybody responds the same. You know that. Right? You've had that person in your life, you're like, man, I'm going to tell them about Jesus, it's going to be amazing. They're going to respond, they might start crying, they might get really happy, maybe they'll start levitating or something, and then they'll get baptized, and we'll be friends, it'll be this amazing testimony, I'll tell them at church, it'll be incredible, and then you go, and you're all ready, you're all fired up, and you share the gospel, and what happens? They don't respond well. They're like, hey, don't be judgmental, don't tell me how to do my life, don't push your gospel on me, you know, and it totally backfires and you're confused because of how they responded. Well, look at this. Jesus is going to talk about four responses, and I want to ask you this, which one do you relate to? And then, and then we're going to ask, how do you relate or how do you respond to the people that respond differently? With me? All right, first one, birds. We talked about that, right? He said, the birds came, they took the seed. He explains it in verse 15. And these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. He's saying this. He's saying, look, in this world, there's opposition. In this world, we have an enemy. In this world, it's not just what you see, what you feel, what you think, but there's this whole other spiritual side where there is the devil, there is demonic forces, and then there is God and the light, darkness and light. You know what I'm talking about? And I think you felt this. There's those days where you got up in the morning and you were excited. You got up and you're like, man, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us be rejoice and be glad. And you know what I'm talking about? You got up, you, you prayed, you did your Bible reading. You, maybe you recited a scripture to yourself and you're thinking, man, today I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spread the gospel. I'm going to be loving to my family. I'm just going to serve the Lord. You had all this passion and then Within minutes, it felt like everything fell apart. It felt like you got hit from every angle. I'm excited. I'm going to serve you, Jesus. And then your significant other, what? 
They're in a bad mood. It's like they had a date with Satan last night. You know what I mean? They're just like at your throat, and you're like, hey, I don't understand it. I'm so excited. You're crushing me here. Or your kids are acting crazy, or there's traffic on the way to the work. The car doesn't start, right? You go to work. You're like, I'm going to be a light here, but then the boss is in a bad mood. And you feel like you get hit all the time. Maybe for some of you, it's on your way to church. You know, that's why as couples, you should drive separate, so then you can't argue during the, no. But you know what I mean? Is that, that I think it's intentional, because scripture tells us we have an enemy that hates the light. And, and Jesus is using this illustration as the word, the gospel's going out, but the enemy looks at it, he's like, whatever it takes, let's destroy it. Whatever it takes, let's shut it down. And you've met people like this. See, this is so important for us to understand because I think the, the tendency for Christians, or at least what people perceive Christians to be like, is that we're judgmental. And it's easy to become judgmental if you forget that there is an enemy that is influencing people. Let me read you this verse. Perla just read it. 2 Corinthians 4, 3, it says this, For our gospel is veiled. It is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel and the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. Here's the reality. I think it's so easy to look at people and be like, how do you believe that? Why do you think that way? Why can't you see it my way? Right? And we have this facade of like, I'm just going to stay away from you because you don't think the way I think. And unless you think the way I think, then you must not be that smart. You know what I'm talking about? And I think when you understand that, wait, no, there's an enemy out there that's literally blinded people's eyes to the truth, it causes us to be compassionate. And it causes us to pray. And it, and it, and it causes us to seek the Holy Spirit to change people's lives. I've seen it. I've met with so many people throughout the years where I've done Bible studies with them. I've sat down with them at coffee and we're reading a text that's literally the Gospel. Like I'm talking like John 3.16, right? Or Romans 3.23, like verses that are so clear and you say, hey, what do you think? And they'll say the most outlandish thing. They'll be like, oh, well, you know, it just kind of feels good or, uh, you know, maybe, maybe it's, it just makes me feel like I'm a good person. You're like, what do you mean it makes you feel like a good person? It's saying you're sinful and you need Jesus. It's the Gospel. But they don't get it and there's been so many moments where I try to talk or debate and then I've paused and I said, you know what? I can't. I can't convince them. The Holy Spirit has to do it. And in that moment, I just pause and I just pray, God, take the veils off their eyes. Change them. Last night at the, at the trunk retreat, my, my prayer during the evening was, Lord, I pray that you'd speak to some of these families because I know they're hurting. I, I know that their marriages are suffering. Or I know that the issues with their kids or broken homes or issues with grandparents or whatever, they're going through it in some way. Nobody, even though we all look like we're good on the outside, inside we're struggling, right? And if you don't have Christ, you're even struggling more. And so my prayer was, Lord, would you take off the veils from their eyes and show them, hey, I need something more. I need something bigger than me. And, and I believe that there's a God and I need Him to help me be a better father, be a better mother, be a better spouse, be a better kid, whatever it is, friend, coworker. It says the enemy has blinded their high. I love 1 Corinthians 1.18. I, I don't love the message, but I think it's true. It says this, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to the, us who are being saved it is the power of God. That's the first group. The birds come. They're, they're just stubborn. They're just, I, I will not accept or believe in this. Look at the second group. It says the rocky ground. Verse 16. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground, the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately they receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. This is the person, they get excited, right? They get super passionate. They're like, yes, I believe my life's changed. Everything's good. But then a couple days, a couple weeks, a couple months, it's back to normal. You ever met that kind of person where they're really passionate all the time about different things? Oh, I'm super excited, you know, I've got this new thing in my life, I'm, I'm going to go for it, and then a couple days later it's a different thing. And I think we've kind of made churches in America like this. We do services where the pastor will tell a really emotional story at the end, we'll dim the lights a little bit, guitar will come up and play, maybe the fog machine comes out, right? We, we pay some people to cry in different corners of the church. Um, 
And then all of a sudden, people are praying, and then they start feeling this emotion, and the guy starts saying, hey, you know what? If you believe in Jesus, uh, he's going to help you accomplish your goals. He's going to take away the hardship. He's going to make your life beautiful. He's going to make it wonderful. He's going to complete your story. Everything's going to be good. Everything's going to be wonderful. And they pray this prayer, and they do it, and they're excited. But what happens is, as soon as a couple days, a couple weeks go by, and they realize, like, wait a second, I believe in Jesus, but my life's still hard. Wait a second, I, I thought I'd have a life coach or a cheerleader or a counselor all the time that's just going to make it better. I thought I'd get the boy, I'd get the girl, the relationship would work out, but it didn't. I'm still struggling, so therefore, I don't want this. And that's why it's so important as a church that yes, we should give gospel invitations. Yes, we want people to be saved, but then we need to disciple them and graft them into our church and care for them and love them and have coffees and all that stuff to mentor. Right? That's why we as a church, we got to be a community. We need all of each other's gifts to hold each other and say, hey, we're staying the course. Hey, I heard you made that confession of faith. That's awesome. Now let's talk about what that means. It's going to be hard, and guess what? There is an enemy, and now you're a target, and he's going to attack you even more because he hates the light inside you. So, hey, let's band together and be together. See the difference? Let's look at this next group here that Jesus talks about. He talks about the thorns, verse 18. And the others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires of other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. This is the issue. I've talked to so many people about this over the years, and that I think our society struggles with the most. I want to believe in Jesus, but I want to live for my own desires. I want to believe in Jesus, but I don't want to give up anything for Jesus. I don't want to obey Him. I'll take salvation, but not obedience. I want to do my own thing. And the God of my life, the desire of my life, is to please myself, to live for my own pleasures and my own desires, because that's where happiness comes from. And so therefore, I worship my own desires rather than Him. And I've seen person after person say, I want to believe in Jesus, but I don't want to give up my sin. I want to believe in Jesus, but I don't want to believe in a God that tells me what I can and can't do. And I think we've seen this mindset play out in our society, and it's been detrimental and destructive. Right? One of the outcries of the last several years has been, an example of it, has been that, that, that my uh, sexual identity and my sexual satisfaction are the greatest good, and that is what defines me. But the problem with that is people have sexual desires that aren't conducive for society. So where do we go with that? If your sexual desire is your identity, but it doesn't fit for a society to flourish, what do you do? Well, here's what happened. I was listening to the news the other day. There's professors out there that, you know what? We shouldn't call pedophiles pedophiles. Because that could be offensive. And they can't help what they like or what they dislike, what they're into, what they're not. And we shouldn't really tell them to suppress it. I mean, yeah, we don't want them to break the law and stuff like that. But it's an identity thing. You can't tell someone to not identify as what they're attracted to. So you know what? We're going to call them um, minor attracted persons. And, and the result, what's going to happen? You're normalizing. You're normalizing that whatever I want sexually, that is my identity. That's who I am. And therefore, it's good that I explore that. But see, the cross of Christ, Scripture says that as a Christian, when you have an attraction that's not of God, if you're a person and you find a minor attractive, you in that moment don't say, well, that's just my identity. That's just who I am, right? No, you say, no, I renounce this. I have been bought with the blood of Jesus Christ, and I'm no longer a slave to my desire. I'm no longer a slave to my sin. I'm a new creation. I've been bought and paid for. I do not have to give in to that. That is not me. What defines me is the cross of Christ. I am a new creation in Him. I'm not defined by my desires or my sins. And I have the ability by the power of the Holy Spirit and Scripture to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. It's totally radically different. And I think that's what we need to proclaim in our society. I get it. I understand that we're in a sinful world, that people have perverted minds. I get it that that comes out, but by the power of the cross, you can change. You can be different. And I know there's people that would hear this and say, oh my gosh, that's horrible. How could you say that? For someone to deny what they're attracted to, uh, that's so restrictive, that's so hateful, that's so shameful. But is it? I mean, for thousands of years, people have been married, right? And for thousands of years, there's been so many people that in that marriage have found someone besides their spouse attractive. And there's been moments where they realize, like, wait a second, I find them attractive, they find me attractive, we could probably have an affair, get away with it, and all would be okay. But that person, because they know God, have said, you know what, I'm going to deny myself. 
I'm going to deny my attraction. I don't live. My God isn't my desire. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say no. Because I made a vow to my spouse, a promise to them that I'd be faithful. I made a vow before God and all those people at my wedding. So therefore, I will deny myself for Christ, for them. And I don't believe there's anybody in this room that's like, wow, what a sick person. No. That's virtuous. That's good. That's righteous. And that's what Scripture, it calls us out of the filth, out of the pit, and into the light. And that's what this story is. And that's what the good soil is. Jesus said, hey, look, the good soil, there's change. The good soil, you're not bogged down with the weeds. You're not broken and lost with your own desire. Let me read you. I love this text in Philippians 3. For many of whom have often told you and now tell you with even tears, walk as enemies of the cross. It's talking about if you don't know Christ. It says their end is their destruction. Look at this. Their God is their belly. Meaning God is my desire. Whatever my desire is, that's my God. That's what comes forth. They, they glory in their shame with their minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven from whom we await a Savior, the Lord Christ Jesus. The good soil. If you've really believed in Christ, your life is radically changed. And I know you're, you're maybe like, well, wait a second. I still sin. That's right. 1 John 1 says, we can't, if you say you have no sin, you're a liar and the truth is not in you. Right? We still struggle as Christians. There's still moments when you give in to your desires. There's still moments when you have doubts. There's still moments where it gets hard and you're like, I want to throw in the towel. But the idea is that you're not perfect, but the dominating direction, the dominating desire of your life is to please Him. And you fail and you have to go to the cross over and over and over again and say, Jesus, I messed up. Forgive me. I'm going to confess to my brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm going to stay the course. I'm going to keep fighting. I'm going to repent. I may fail over and over again, but I'm keep moving forward because I love you, Jesus. You've changed me. You're not just my Savior. You're my God and my Lord, my Father. And out of gratitude because of the gospel, I want to change. My change doesn't save me. My change is a result that you have saved me. You see the difference there? See the difference? But so here's the big question. What is your response? You've looked at these different seeds. The word of God's gone out. How do you respond? If you're here this morning and you're kind of like, uh, you know what? I, I, I'm still, I'm like that, that first grain. I'm like that first seed that, that I, I kind of, I don't, I don't want Jesus. I, I don't believe in him. I, 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 don't, I can't really rationalize how it works with science. Or I can't really rationalize. I was so hurt when I was young. My family was broken. I'm so wounded that how could there be a good God and I struggle with this? How could there be a good God in hell? And a lot of those are valid questions. But if your heart is so hard and you're like, I, I don't need this, I just ask you. If there is one chance, if there's the smallest percent of a chance that this is real and eternity is real, isn't it worth you pausing in your life to study it? Isn't it worth maybe even, you don't believe in a God, but maybe you could pause and pray and say, God, I don't believe in you. But if you're there, would you pull at my heart? Would you do something? And if you're like, yeah, prayer is a waste of time. Okay, waste one minute of your day. Try it. Maybe start reading. Maybe talk to a Christian and have an open heart for a moment because if there's just a half of 1% that it's real, it's worth a little bit of your time. If you're here and you're like the second seed that, that, that you've, life has been, your life has been inconsistent, I'm excited. I'm not excited. I, I, put a, I, I believed in Jesus, but then I fell back. Oh, then I believed in Jesus, then I fell back. And that's been your life. Hey, get involved in the church. Get some Christians around you that you can say, hey, you know what? I've been inconsistent. I've struggled. But will you come alongside me and hold me accountable? I really want to truly believe not just in a God that's going to make my life a fairy tale, but a God that can be my God and Lord over my life because I can't figure it out myself. I need Him. If you're here and your response is, hey, I'm holding on to my sin. I can't give up my desire. I can't give up my, my anger my jealousy, my lust, my, my lies. Hey, I just want to encourage you. James 1 says, sin when it's full grown brings forth death. It will not work out in the end. It will wreak havoc on your life. I don't care who in society is telling you, oh, sin's a good thing, just love it, that's just old school stuff. No, you cannot get away with it and one day you're going to stand before God. And He sees all things but here's something that we haven't 
yet said, and I promise we'll close in a moment. If you are a Christian, if you do believe in Christ, if you are that good seed that fell on good soil, you believe the word, how do you respond to these types of people? I think as Christians, we've responded poorly, not all Christians, but a lot of them, that we, we have this feeling now of they don't believe, or this person doesn't believe in my politics, or this person believes in different morals than I do, and so we argue, we, we, we you know, post signs up that tell people how horrible they are, and we kind of stand you know, with a 10-foot pole, get away with me, get away from me, I, I don't want to be stained by you, I'm going to move to a more conservative state, or I'm going to move away, I've got to put up walls and protect myself. Look at what section of verses comes right after this parable. Verse 21, and Jesus said to them, is a lamp brought in to put under a basket or under a bed and not on a stand? For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to the light. If anyone has an ear to hear, let him hear. The whole purpose of the church, of the good seed, is to be a light for the other. And, and, and I think... We've got this backwards in our society as Christians. We look at the news, it doesn't look like it's getting better. World's going to hell in a handbasket. You know, I can't believe all these decisions. What are we going to do? What about the environment? What do we, you know, we argue back and forth, and we think maybe we get the right politician or the right person here, then everything's going to work out. We're all going to be good. But the reality is I believe the only thing that's going to save our society and save the world is the gospel of Jesus Christ, is that people's eyes will be opened that integrity will come not out of moral obligation, but out of the Holy Spirit changing their lives in the Word of God. We're going to see families change. Remember last week that 90% of our homeless population grew up without a father. You want to solve homelessness? Let's rebuild the families. Let's equip people and say, look, the Word of God says, hey, be faithful. Love when you don't want to love. Care for when you don't want to care for. Right? If people come to know Christ, their lives will be radically changed. We'll see our families change. We'll see ourselves changed. That's the message, and that's our job to be a light. And that's my prayer for our church. You know, our, our cheesy model is pray, love, share, right? I want us to live that. One, pray. Let's pray. God, take off the blinders of people's eyes. May they see the hope of the gospel. Let's love, right? How do you love? You do random acts of kindness, intentional acts of kindness over time. Right? Hey, you know what? I'm going to mow your lawn today. Why? I don't know. I'm just going to do it for you. I'm your neighbor. Right? I'll change your oil. I'll be the one that brings the food to work. I'll be that light. And over time, what you've done is you've shown people like, wait, you're different. You're intentional. You're not just going to kind of cram the Bible down my throat, but you've actually invested in me. I want our church to be like that. And then lastly, we share, right? Some of the seed's not going to work. Some of it's going to, you know, the birds are going to take off. Some is going to fall on bad ground. But hey, what if one seed works? What if the entire point of your life is that you're going to be a light to one single person and they're going to come to no faith? Guess what? That's not a wasted life. That's an intentional, meaningful life. And that's what I want our church to be about. So what is your response to Jesus? And if you have believed in Jesus, what is your response to this world? It's a broken world. That's no shock. That's no surprise. Let's be a light. Let's pray. Father, I, I thank You for this story in the Bible. God, I, I thank You that because of Your Gospel, there is hope. Jesus, I thank You that so many of us know You this morning, and I believe that is only possible by the power of Your Holy Spirit removing the veils from our eyes. And You saved us. God, I pray that You would use our church to be a light. I pray that You'd use all the Christian churches around here that are preaching Your Gospel to be a light. I pray that revival would go out throughout this country, throughout this world. God, I pray for those of us who we've responded poorly to the Gospel in the past. Some of us were still struggling with Jesus. I don't want to surrender fully because I love my sin. And I pray that today You would come and say, I am better. Your sin is killing you, but I am good. I'm the good physician. I am the healer. Be saved. Lord, I pray if there's anyone here that maybe it is the first time, maybe it's the thousandth time they've prayed a prayer, but today may it be the day where they're like, Jesus, I fully and wholly trust in Your work on the cross that You are God, that You died for my sins, and I am a sinner. And my identity, I don't want it to be in my sin or my desires anymore. I want it to be in You. Save me. 
God, I pray for us as Christians that You would embolden us and give us a heart like this sower that we would want to see people grow, the people come to know You. God, I pray that our church will be a light. I pray that You protect us from the enemy. You are wonderful as always. You are marvelous in every way. In Your good name we pray, Jesus. Amen.